But <clears throat> the point of this graph just is that we actually more than keep up with this deflation. Uh, some economists worry about if there's a 50% deflation rate with information technology, and information technology is taking over more and more of the economy, and it will be most of the economy in the 2020s will have massive shrinking of the economy, but we actually more than double our consumption of these technologies every year. Uh, people didn't buy iPods for $15,000, which is what it would have cost 15 years ago. As, as price performance reaches certain levels, whole new applications explode on the landscape. National Institutes of Health wouldn't be collecting a million genomes if they cost as much as the first genome cost, which was a billion dollars. At $1,000 each, they're willing to do that. So the biotechnology revolution is really the intersection of biology with information technology. And there are a lot of old line biologists who are not information technologists, who are really not, uh, don't have the information technology tools uh, to understand this type of progression. And a lot of people will look at the complexity of biology using an old paradigm, assuming that nothing has changed, that it's still the same old hit or miss paradigm, and that the progress is going to continue in a linear manner. And if that were true, then yes, it would take centuries to develop the kinds of technologies we're talking about. But because it's an information technology, because these technologies are going to double in power every year, and that's exactly what we've seen in every area of, of bio, biological technology, the genome was a very good example of that, but it's also true of the Proteome Project, where we're now exploring how uh, genetic sequences express themselves in proteins, and the Connectome Project, how we're exploring the connections in the brain, and many other aspects of biology are gearing up in this exponential manner. Uh, DNA sequencing costs has come down smoothly by very close to half every year. It was $10 per base pair in 1990. It's a small fraction of a penny today. This slope is a very smooth doubling of the total amount of genetic data that was sequenced every year. And we see the same progression uh, in every other aspect of biology. <clears throat> and we are now actually simulating biological processes. And these are actually entering the mainstream. The FDA will accept for certain phases of testing now on vaccines, uh, simulator data. And we're going to see simulator data in more and more aspects of testing. So even testing will be accelerated. Uh, we can design interventions on computers. Every aspect of health and medicine is now becoming a computer technology. Communication technology, I just cite this as, as other examples. We have 50 different ways of measuring this. I mean, here's that graph I had of the internet. Uh, it was called the ARPANET, and I had only a few points uh, at the lower left-hand portion of the graph, uh, but I projected it out, and indeed, uh, this happened right on schedule. If we look at the same data on a linear scale, this is now the same information, it looks like this. So it looks like the World Wide Web came out of nowhere in the mid-1990s, but you could see it coming if you looked at the exponential progression. We're shrinking technology at an exponential pace. This uh, pertains to the third bridge, the nanotechnology revolution, which is a little bit further out, uh, but we're going to ultimately go beyond the limitations of biology and really redesign the mechanisms that biology is based on. Already, there's not a single organ you can point to, the heart, the liver, there's already an artificial pancreas, uh, there's artificial kidneys that aren't being developed or even in therapeutic trials uh, to really redesign this sort of outdated version 1.0 biological bodies we have. But ultimately, we can do this at the molecular level. And that revolution is about 20, 25 years away. But we're shrinking technology very smoothly at an exponential rate of about 100 in 3D volume per decade. So these technologies will be 100,000 times smaller in 3D volume in key feature size in about 25 years. And if I were to say someday you will have <clears throat> millions of nanobots, blood cell size devices with little computers in them, robotic devices in your bloodstream, keeping you healthy from inside uh, in about 25 years, you'd say that sounds very futuristic. But I'd point out that there's already dozens of experiments of doing exactly that 
uh, in animal experiments with the first generation of nano-engineered devices. For example, one scientist cured type 1 diabetes with a blood cell size device. Nano-engineered, has 7 nanometer pores, lets insulin out in a controlled fashion, blocks antibodies because type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder. Uh, there's a device that can detect cancer cells that's blood cell size and latch onto them and destroy them. So these are early experiments, but again, keep in mind that these devices will be a billion times more powerful per dollar in 25 years, 100,000 times smaller in key feature size, and you get some idea of what will be feasible. What you just were watching was a uh, animation of a design, of Rob Friedis' design of a blood cell, red blood cell uh, robotic device, a robotic version of a red blood cell. And a conservative analysis of these respirator sites indicates that they are about a thousand times more powerful than the biological variant, which is, uh, brings up an interesting observation about biology. Although biology is very intricate and very clever, it's also very suboptimal compared to what we ultimately can design when we redesign it uh, with uh, nanotechnology. And these respirator sites are a thousand times more powerful, so if you replace a portion of your red blood cells with these, you could do an Olympic sprint for 15 minutes without taking a breath, or sit at the bottom of your pool for four hours, and ultimately we will be able to design biological equivalents of our current biological systems that will be far more durable. We ultimately will have billions of these nanobots inside our bloodstream. Uh, this is, uh, well, this is a design of a robotic white blood cell, uh, that could go through the, the bloodstream and actually detect pathogens and destroy them and do them much more quickly than our biological white blood cells. I've actually watched one of my white blood cells trap and destroy a bacteria, but it took about an hour and a half to do it. They're very slow. They're clever, but they're slow. Uh, these robotic versions ultimately could do that in a matter of seconds. They could download new software from the internet to combat specific pathogens. If downloading software into a device inside your body sounds futuristic, I'd point out that you can already do that. You can put a computer in your brain to replace a portion of your brain destroyed by Parkinson's disease if you're a Parkinson's patient. And the latest generation actually allows you to download new software to the computer inside your brain from outside the patient. So that's today. It's not blood cell size today, it's pea size. But again, keep in mind these things will be 100,000 times smaller in 25 years, a billion times more powerful and you get some idea of what will be feasible. So we'll have plenty of computation as we go through the 21st century. That's what's driving a lot of this, but it's not all computation. This is not all derived from Moore's Law. Moore's Law is, some people think Moore's Law is synonymous with what I call the Law of Accelerating Returns. But actually Moore's Law is just one example of many examples of this pervasive exponential growth of any technology when you can measure the underlying information properly.